Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman imprisons several Twitter dissidents. I'm going to get into the fascinating history of Saudi Arabia, which in 2018 finally allowed women to drive. So in some ways has made leaps forward with regard to human rights, but in others continues to brutalize its citizens. The Supreme Court in India is hearing cases pertaining to several new anti-religious conversion laws. One of the biggest power grid operators in the United States has come out and said that all of the clean energy pushes that we are making is going to overwhelm our power grid. And finally, for our timeless topic of the day, I discuss how the way that we treat our elderly reveals so much about our culture. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. I hope that you're having a great week. I've got to tell you, and I would love if you would uh, let me know if you agree with this. I'm finding the passage of time to be really difficult lately. I can't believe that it's March of this year. It seems like it was just New Year's. And I think for me, I'm especially thinking about May coming up because that will mark one year since I graduated from college. I'm sort of viewing this first year out of college as, you know, the time when I can make mistakes. I'm just barely an adult, barely supposed to be responsible. But once it hits that one year mark and a whole new crop of students graduates and comes into the working world, I think it will really hit <laughs> that I'm never going back to college and have to assume full adult responsibilities. Anyway, it's just, it's unbelievable that we are here almost a quarter into 2023. You can follow me on Insta and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. Please also like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And let me know what you think of the show. You can email me about anything at julie at julie-hartman.com. For our first story of the day, Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has imprisoned several Twitter dissidents that have spoken out against him and his regime. The most recent of these individuals who have been imprisoned is Saad Almani, who is a joint American and Saudi citizen, who in November of 2019 issued a 14 word tweet that said Mohammed bin Salman has taken over the economy, defense and everything under the king. Now, that doesn't seem to be particularly challenging to the crown prince or his regime. But nevertheless, Mohammed bin Salman and his uh, cronies, if you will, took umbrage to this tweet. And after seven years, uh, seven years after, I should say, Mr. Almani tweeted this, he went to Saudi Arabia just a few months ago where he was arrested and detained. And he has been sentenced to 16 years in prison. Again, even though he just tweeted it seven years ago, they found him, they have had their eye on him, and now he is in jail. He was, an, he was originally uh, sentenced to fewer years in prison, but then he appealed, which led to the sentence being extended to 16 years. And the Saudi Khan Prince's police force has said that this tweet by Mr. Almani shows that he has, quote, adopted a terrorist agenda by defaming symbols of the state and that he has supported a terrorist ideology. He actually, I have to make a correction here, he was originally sentenced to 16 years in prison, but his appeal caused him to have his sentence expanded to 19 years in prison. He's now being held in Al Hair prison, which is a facility in the Saudi capital of Rida that houses members of Al Qaeda alongside other political activists. Another dissident who was jailed for her remarks on Twitter is a woman named Nora al Qatani. She ran a Twitter account where she said that the prince was not good enough to be in charge, and she was found guilty of, quote, challenging the faith and justice of the king and the crown prince and supporting the ideology of people who strive to disturb public order. Like Mr. Almani, she was sentenced to 13 years in prison, but then when she appealed, her sentence was extended to a staggering 
45 years in prison. A third example of a dissident that I will tell you about is a woman named Salma al Shaib. She's a doctoral student and she was sentenced to 34 years in prison for a tweet that was disparaging towards the Saudi government. The history of Saudi Arabia, I mean, certainly throughout its, its time of, of being a country and a civilization is very interesting, but especially it is fascinating because of the transformations that it has made in recent years that for a time gave a lot of people, especially in the West, a lot of hope that Saudi Arabia was adopting a system more like ours that treated its citizens with equality and respect. The Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, since his time taking office, has really in many ways transformed Saudi Arabia from being a conservative, backward Islamic kingdom to one of the more progressive states in the Middle East. The principal example of this is that in 2019, the Crown Prince allowed women to drive. For decades, women were not allowed to do so. And now in Saudi Arabia, women, among other things, work as Amazon delivery drivers, as chief executives, even ambassadors in the government. Additionally, music was once one of the things that was not allowed to have been played in public. And the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman allowed it to be played. And now you walk into a restaurant in Saudi Arabia and it's not uncommon to hear rock and roll or rap or upbeat pop music. And another thing that he did is that he allowed uh, the two different sexes to intermingle in public. Previously, there was staunch gender segregation, but he reversed that. So in many, way, in many ways, he seems to have embraced a more forward-looking uh, approach to governance and human rights for all citizens. But then if you look at these, these dissidents against his regime being silenced and imprisoned for decades, it shows that the Saudi state has not transformed as thoroughly as we would all have liked it to. Additionally, Mohammed bin Salman has pursued close ties with Xi Jinping and the Chinese regime. I've talked a lot about that deal that the Saudis and the Chinese made earlier this year that has brought more hydrogen energy development to Saudi Arabia. And also the Saudis have allowed Huawei, which is uh, China's tech company that has cell phone towers and that hosts certain cell phones, they've allowed that company to come in and build in Saudi cities. The repression, though, under the crown prince is really noteworthy because what Saudi citizens say is that under the previous rulers, though in many ways, I mean, in almost every way, human rights were m more frequently violated, they said that they knew the red lines that enclosed them that curbed freedom of speech. The royal family was a no-no, the king was a no-no, and talking in a disparaging way towards Islam was also known to have been strictly prohibited. But now citizens say that a lot of people don't quite know what exactly is permissible and that the crown prince is doing this to create a climate of intimidation and fear so that people better not take a risk and say anything poorly about the government lest they be thrown in prison for decades. In another international relations story, India is in the news because of its anti-religious conversion laws that are now being contested by several citizens in cases that are being heard by the Supreme Court of India. I've been thinking about that saying that many elders, who I'm going to be talking about as a group later on in the show, I'm going to be discussing the elderly, that, that many elders say to us that comparison is the enemy of joy. That is certainly true in interpersonal relations, but with regard to international relations, comparison is the facilitator of joy for we Americans. And this, certainly this ex example of uh, violations of freedom of speech in Saudi Arabia is, uh, proves that, and this case of anti-religious conversion laws in India also prove the same thing. India, like the United States, consists of a federation 
a federated union, I should say, of several different states. There are 28 in total. And in 11 of these states, mostly controlled by the Hindu Bharata Janata Party, or the BJP, which is the party of the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in these 11 states, there are several anti-religious conversion laws that are titled Freedom of Religion Acts that purport to prevent religious conversions when done by force, fraud, allurement, or inducement. But in reality, they just make it harder for citizens to convert. One of the things that these laws prohibit, as I said, is when a religious conversion is perceived to have been done for an incentive or in a way that pushed the convert to, to, to convert in, in a way that they may not have wanted to. But if you think about conversions, specifically with this idea of incentive, a lot of the times when people convert, they're incentive is sort of the operating factor. You think you're going to be closer to God. You think you are going to have a better chance of getting into heaven. That is the case in almost all religious conversions. So this law is designed in a way to try to make it easy to find something wrong with the conversion and to prevent it from happening. And the thing that's really behind all of this is Hindu animus towards Muslims in India. Now, there have been a lot of cases of Muslim-backed uh, terror in the country against the uh, Hindus and the Hindu Nationalist Party. In fact, the prime minister I mentioned, Narendra Modi, is a big Hindu nationalist figure in the country who has tried to bring back a distinct Hindu character to the country when previous leaders like Indira Gandhi have tried to make it more religiously pluralistic. So these anti-conversion laws are definitely aimed at preventing people from converting to Islam. In fact, one of the uh, state statues, this is from the Himachal Pradesh state in its 2019 Freedom of Religion Act, says that it, in large part it is done because of, quote, several instances of marriage done to increase the strength of a particular religion. Interestingly, when citizens are alleged to have participated in or facilitated a wrongful conversion, the burden of proof lies on the person who has caused the conversion. Now, this is just a total inversion from the way that our system of law works here in the United States, where if you are alleging or purporting that someone has committed a crime or violated the law, the burden of responsibility or proof is incumbent upon you, the accuser, to prove that that person is guilty. So this is just another way that the law really, again, tries to make it quite difficult to have these conversions go through. These laws were primarily enacted over a period of about five years from about 2017 to 2022 when the BJP was in power. And another key feature is that these laws require anyone seeking to convert to inform a magistrate a month in advance of his or her intention to convert. And that gives the magistrate or the government a lot of time to build up a case as to why that, per that person should not be allowed to convert. The Indian Supreme Court, as I said, is hearing several challenges to these cases, but depending on the party or the religious affiliation of the justices, it remains to be seen which way the Supreme Court will rule. And by the way, I love on this show giving a background or a history of certain countries. And I actually gave a background of India a few weeks ago. Sean, what is the episode called? India 101. Is that right? Wow, I'm pretty good with names. I got the Dennis and Julie show name yes, or two days ago. What was that called? Great people? I'm just showing off. Uh, yeah, but you should, you, I encourage you to watch that episode because India is just a fascinating country, especially given how much it has changed in the past 50 years. It was once a British colony and then it became independent and it went through s several wars and uprisings specifically between the Hindu and the Muslim population. And what's specifically fascinating about the history of India is that two other countries came about during its independence from Britain. Spoiler alert, those two countries are Pakistan and Bangladesh. And actually, Pakistan and Bangladesh had civil wars with one another in the 70s, which separated them as two distinct countries. Bangladesh used to be known as East Pakistan. 
Anyway, I will not regale you with India facts, but again, please do watch that episode. I think you will really enjoy it. Now, going on to domestic news, it is no secret that Democrats in this country have tried to push us towards more clean energy sources. These pushes range from the Green New Deal proposed by AOC and her allies to states like New York and California outlawing electric or excuse me, gas powered vehicles in favor of electric powered vehicles by 2035. And recently, one of the largest grid operators in the United States, this is PJM Interconnection, has released a, por a report warning against these pushes towards clean energy. The report covers the power supply and demand of PJM interconnection through 2030 across the 13 states that it services. And those 13 states cover 65 million people in the United States. And it concluded that fossil fuel power plants are retiring much faster than renewable sources are getting developed, which could lead to severe energy imbalances and catastrophes. I wrote an article about this back in November in the Epic Times. It's called Wake Up America, Soon is the Winter of Our Discontent. I really went into a summary of the elect of the uh, power problems that we are soon to be facing at very severe levels. It is so irresponsible for people to want to push us so quickly towards these renewable energy sources. Certainly as a long-term goal, it may not be a bad thing, but to completely outlaw gas-powered vehicles by 2035 is essentially energy suicide, and PJM agrees. The report says that 40,000 megawatts of power generation, that's enough to light up 30 million households, are at risk of retiring by 2030. This represents about 21% of PJM's current capacity. It is also said that the historical rate of completion for renew renewable energy products has been approximately 5%. So if you look at uh, President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, for example, that's something that he points to to say, oh, we will be able to uh, create a country where we can facilitate all of these renewable energy sources. We're providing subsidies for wind and solar power. But again, this PJM report has showed that the rate of completion for these is very small. And over time, as fossil fuel plants are retiring, and also, as I discuss in the Epic Times article, nuclear power plants are retiring and not getting rebuilt, we are going to have to shift more towards these energy sources and our power grid just does not have the capability to handle it. By the way, a Wall Street Journal article a few months ago illustrated this beautifully, I mean soberingly, but, but very well. When they followed a person who traveled across the country in an electric powered vehicle and they showed how um, onerous the, the journey is, how difficult it is to rely solely on electric powered devices. This person every few hours had to stop and, and recharge the car with a battery, which takes uh, three to four hours uh, to recharge a car, a Tesla or one of the other electric powered cars. Whereas when you get gas, you can just put it in your tank and go on your merry way. So it created a lot of backups because people were waiting in line for the battery chargers. Also, this whole idea that a car like a, a Tesla vehicle is somehow more clean than gas powered vehicles is just BS because first of all, you plug in the battery to the Tesla and the uh, cord is ultimately connected to electricity or has electricity funneling fuel uh, through it. So in order to create that electricity, it requires fossil fuels to be burned to generate it. So maybe it's not putting gas into a car, but it's relying on fossil fuels in another indirect way, but nevertheless in still a prominent way. And also the batteries inside of these cars that are that supposedly make them so green need rare minerals in order to 
build the battery. Essentially, these rare minerals are a part of the battery. And in order to get these rare minerals, you have to mine for them, which creates a lot of pollution and waste. So it's just, again, there, there's no like, this whole idea that there are just these clean energy sources is so misguided because at the end of the day, we end up mining and getting our fossil fuels from somewhere. This PJM report said, in an optimistic case, 21,000 megawatts of wind, solar, and battery storage capacity will be added to the grid by 2030. But that is about half of the expected fossil fuel retirements. And the PJM report said that during the Arctic blast of December of 2020, when, when snow and blizzards hit the East Coast, PJM ordered a lot of its businesses and homes to pull back on its power usage and homes. And most of those generators switched to burning oil. But this article, which talks about this PJM report, aptly asked, what happens when those power plants shut down? What happens in another case where a winter storm causes these homes and businesses to curtail their power they, and they can't switch to burning oil? They're going to freeze. That means they, they can't heat their homes and businesses. So PJM anticipates a lot of big power so shortages if we continue down the road that we are going down. And it is a life or death situation because people need heat. They will get frostbite. They will not be able to heat their homes if we do not have these energy sources that they can rely on. And it is just yet another example of the very irresponsible, ill-advised policies that on the surface seem really great, but in actuality can really harm and in many cases kill people. On that happy note, let's turn to our timeless topic of the day. And I'm going to be talking about the elderly. And this discussion comes from an experience that I had a few months ago that I have been reflecting on. And ever since I saw what I saw during this story I'm about to tell you, I have had my eye open for other instances of it and I see it almost every day. And that is elderly people in this country being treated with disrespect, being treated as if they don't matter, as if they're invisible. I was at a grocery store a few months ago. By the way, I was telling you all a few shows ago about a grocery store experience I had where there was a homeless person and uh, he was uh, flipping a, a knife. I feel like all the stories I tell you uh, begin in grocery stores, but hey, it's a place where I spend a lot of my time. But at a different grocery store, I was walking in and there was an elderly woman who was carrying a lot of bags and she seemed to be struggling and she was walking out of the store. And there was a man about, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30 years old with big bulging muscles. And he just cut this woman off, went right in front of her, walked out of the store, didn't even look at her, didn't even think, wow, I'm a you know healthy young man with big bulging muscles. I, more than anyone, can help this woman carry all of her groceries. Also, he's a man, you should be chivalrous towards women. There were just so many things that were wrong about that interaction. I ended up, I'm not saying this to get a prize, I'm just telling you that because I'm, I'm sure you're wondering, I did end up helping the woman carry the groceries to her car. And she said to me, thank you so much for doing this. She said, people, you wouldn't believe how many people cut me off. They treat me like I'm invisible. And she said, and this is what really stuck with me. She said, when I was younger, things were so different. Men would walk into stores and look around for older women or older men who they could help out. People would go out of their way to treat the elderly with deference and respect. And it got me thinking about this greater subject of how we Americans treat our elder, elderly today. And what's interesting about it is that on the surface, this seems like one problem. But then if you kind of pine deeper, there are a lot of other problems or pathologies that make this culture of disparaging or not treating the elderly with respect possible. And that's the case with a lot of human pathologies. One pathology often beneath it or alongside it has a lot of different others. And beneath this mistreatment of elderly, I have, of the elderly, excuse me, I have concluded also reveals how status-driven we are, 
how narcissistic we are, and how we have no sense of our obligation or duty in society. So I'm going to explain each one of those for you. But first, as background, most cultures throughout history have, be have venerated their elderly population. Most obviously this is the case in Asian cultures and still continues to be the concept of filial piety that you treat your parents and your grandparents with respect because the society that you are living in now, and especially if it's a good society, you realize was created by those people who are older than you and they deserve your, again, respect. But really, in the 80s and 90s here in the United States, this so went by the wayside. People stopped seeing the elderly as a population to sort of carve out as special and to have a sense of duty towards. And instead what happened is that instead of venerating our elderly, we started to venerate another vulnerable segment of our population, but the complete opposite, that is children. It used to be the case that people would treat the elderly with a lot of respect and they would kind of like not ignore children, but, but children wouldn't be as much of a priority. And now people go out of their ways to brag about and idolize and spend all their time with their children. And they think that elderly people just don't deserve to have any time devoted to them because, oh, well, they're old and kind of batty and they don't need it. But all, what, what is really behind this shift towards venerating kids more than the elderly is actually, I think, status. Kids who in the 80s and 90s started to be seen as status symbols in large part because of the baby boomers. So when the baby boomers started having kids and with all due respect to the baby boomers, they're kind of the generation that in this country ruined a lot of things. They are the sons and daughters of the World War II generation, the greatest generation in American history. But the World War II generation were so focused on giving their kids what they didn't have the material abundance that they lacked, that in large part they forgot to give their kids, that is the baby boomers, a lot of the values that they held. So then when the baby boomers started having kids, they viewed their kids as yet another way to kind of gain status. This is when we see uh, sports leagues, which I talk about so much on this show, becoming really competitive and more about winning and less about recreation. What do you think is really behind that? It's parents. It's parents wanting to see their kids beat the other kid on the soccer field or in the pool. And, and it's no longer about letting the kids have fun, but more about bringing joy to the parents. Even if you look at these crazy, insane birthday parties that the wealthy give for their kids who are one and two years old, you see this on reality television all the time, that these rich moms are throwing these like $20,000 birthday parties for their one-year-old kid with you know a bouncy house and all of these donuts and all of these cakes. And you watch that and you think, why are they doing this? The kid is one years old, the kid is never going to remember this birthday party. But the answer is that the birthday party isn't about the kid, it's about the parent. And again, it's just yet another example of how kids are seen as these status symbols. Certainly the push to get into college, how obsessive people have become about gaining admission to elite universities is about kids as these status symbols. And so in turn, as kids have become more venerated, the elderly have become less so because the elderly can't provide you with any kind of status. Unless of course you're Henry Kissinger or some other old person who has been famous or who is rich or, or who has lived some publicly consequential life. Knowing an older person isn't seen as something that you can brag about, isn't seen as a conduit to bring uh, and confer status upon yourself. So again, I really think behind this disregard of the elderly in large part is this status obsession that we have. Relatedly, we have become a narcissistic culture. One of the reasons why people previously throughout our history treated the elderly so well is that they were smart to realize that they one day would be elderly, that they one day would become old, and that 
if they created a culture where older people were treated with respect, then when their time came, hopefully they would be treated with respect too. But so much of our population today is so myopic and uh, self-dealing in their focus. It's a little paradoxical, paradoxical, excuse me, because you would think that if you are a narcissist, they would, it would be even more of a reason for you to want to create a culture where the elderly is treated well so that you one day can be treated well. But narcissists don't think that far in advance. They focus so much on the here and now and on themselves. And so, and, and again, it goes back to why we treat kids so well. Being Treating kids, uh, young kids, is better for your interest because they can grow and they can continue to fulfill you and bring you joy and status for the rest of your life. lives. People don't see any self-interest in being kind to older people. And in fact, they only see being kind to older people as something that gets in their way. On a small level, that big burly man who I saw in the grocery store literally saw that woman as someone that was getting in his way of getting out the door and onto his next location fast enough. But even on a greater level, in American society, it used to be common for the elderly to live in the homes of their adult children. I actually have a friend in college who's from Poland, and I asked him one of the biggest culture shocks he uh, had when coming to attend university in the States. And one of the things that he said to me was how disgusting it is, the way that we just totally disregard our parents and our grandparents. He said in Poland, his grandmother lived in their home until the day that she died. And there's sort of a culture um, among the Polish where if you don't treat your grandparent with respect, then you are seen as sort of a lowly person, someone who they themselves is not worthy of respect. But here in the United States, it's a given that you wouldn't have an elderly person live in the home with you, that you wouldn't take time out of your day to call your grandmother or your grandfather, because again, it's getting in the way of what you need to achieve that day. And finally, and also relatedly, the way that we treat our elderly reveals that we no longer feel that obligation and duty are words that should be in our vocabulary. And even more importantly, that they are things that we should strive to abide by. Think about even those two words. I did a show recently on uh, uh, Google Ngrams, which is this database that tracks the frequency of words used in books over time. And both obligation and duty as words in books have declined so much over the past two decades, or not just two decades, many, many decades, but especially since the 21st century. When we encounter someone, we almost always put people, this is an American culture I'm saying, into certain categories, and everything follows from that category that that person is put in. And we think when we look at someone, what can that person do for me? We no longer at all think, what do I owe that person? What can I do for that person? We don't want to do anything unless we get uh, praise for it. How does helping an elderly woman carry her groceries to her car get us any kind of praise? No one will know that we did that, but again, we, we used to live in a society where duty in itself was a reward. Fulfilling your obligations was seen as noble and you knew that you were contributing in a way to creating a good culture in your society, but not anymore. And so to wrap up in summary, as I started out this segment, this one pathology, like many other pathologies, reveals so many others beneath the surface. It's not just the problem that we treat our elderly poorly. There are all of these other things that we have. We're so status driven, we're narcissistic, we don't feel a sense of obligation or duty that contribute to this problem. And if you look at many other problems in our culture, culture you will see so many of the underlying pathologies that cause it, and many of them sadly are connected. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And remember that each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, and act with principle and determination. Take care. <laughs>